My name is Tyle Hertzens. I'm the editor-in-chief of Inner Fidelity. Uh, I've measured, probably done about a thousand headphone measurements in my, my time. I got 500 up on Inner Fidelity and then of course there are many measurements that don't quite make it for one reason or another or they're measurements of something that I can't publish um, and also a lot of measurements I did while I was at Headroom. <clears throat> okay. So the first thing to know is what we're looking for is flat, and that there is such a thing as flat. It's you put a speaker in an anechoic chamber, you put a microphone out directly in front of the speaker. If the speaker is perfectly flat, responds the same at all frequencies, uh, has the same gain, you'll see that on a microphone, and we're going to call that flat. And we're going to try to figure out what that looks like on a pair of headphones. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying that perfectly flat is best. We don't know that exactly. Um, we don't know where even flat is yet. Uh, but um, it's a reference. Like, so it may not necessarily the, sound the best. It certainly doesn't take into account all sorts of things like time coherency and so on and so forth. But it's a start. <clears throat> so. Uh, this is what a headphone measurement sheet looks like. Uh, that's frequency response up there, and that's what we're going to talk about first. And just to identify all the things on here, on your second sheets, you've got some. That's frequency response. That is an uncorrected frequency response and a corrected frequency response, and we'll talk about those in just a second. That's isolation, how much noise gets held away uh, from you when you listen to a pair of headphones. So, Sealed headphones will show a deeper uh, amount of isolation. This is the impedance and electrical phase response of the headphones. This is the 30 hertz square wave response, and then the 300 hertz square wave response, the impulse response, and a total harmonic distortion plus noise. And then we got a couple of little things here, numbers here that give us efficiency and uh, broadband isolation and a couple of other things. But for starters, we're going to look at frequency response. <clears throat> so here's, we say a speaker's flat. We just put a microphone out here, put it in an anechoic chamber, or as the gentleman before me said, uh, gate the signal. And uh, if this microphone measures flat, then we know that speaker is flat and all is good. Now the problem is, what do you hear when you put your head in front of the speaker and what's at your eardrum. And the reason why that's important for headphones is because when you put headphones on, there is no place to put a microphone in there where you have some kind of audio signal that's propagating by it without a bunch of reflections around it. The last guy here was telling us about gating signals so that you don't get any reflections in the, in the measured signal and then you can know what's really there. Well in something that's this small, you're not going to get away from the reflections. There's all sorts of stuff going on inside this coupler. And that's an important word to understand. This is a, a, a headphone is an acoustic coupler. So it, it doesn't send sound out into space for propagating. It couples the sound to your ear. And the only legitimate place for you to measure sound in a headphone is at the eardrum because well, that's what it's intended to do, is get sound to your eardrum flat. So, well, what does flat look like at the eardrum? That's what we're after here. What we're, what we're going to go after here first is take the microphone away, put your head in front of it, and what does the frequency response look like at your eardrum and why? So this little chart, I just love because, man, there's only like one of them that I've found, and that's it. Um, this is uh, for a 45 degree angle of incidence, so sound coming from 45 degrees away from you, uh, what the EQ of that sound is due to your body, your head and torso, the reflections off your ears, and so on and so forth. And each of these lines represent a different component of EQ that happens. And this big line is the overall uh, response. So for 45 degrees off axis, 
at the eardrum, you're going to have a 20 dB peak at uh, about 2.7 K. Um, 20 dB peak. Okay, that's a lot. Um, but that's real. And that's what your head is used to hearing. And your head is amazingly good at figuring out how to hear something and, and making it right. Your brain wants you to be able to understand what you're hearing, and it tries very hard to make that work. And you've lived with this curve your whole life, and therefore, it sounds flat to you. So where does this curve come from? Okay, so number one here is the spherical head. So <clears throat> your head has gain at high frequencies as you go up in frequency. You imagine uh, in an in a ocean setting, you know, water, the shoreline setting, you have a, a pier uh, from a, a piling that goes to a, a dock or something like that. So you got water and a pier right there. And if you have big, long waves, they're going to go right past that piling completely unimpeded. Uh, unimpeded. And the amplitude of the wave is going to stay just like it is when you look at it at the edge of the piling, which is the, your head, okay? But as the waves get faster and faster and faster, pretty soon the wavelength of those waves are getting to be about half a wavelength is about the size of the piling, and they'll start bouncing off. And at very high frequency, little ripples, you'll, there'll be a shadow behind the piling where the ripples aren't, okay? Because the piling is completely interfering with the, the signal coming in. So you have boundary gain, and that's as the frequency goes up, the amplitude of the signal on the side of the head, as it, as it has to reflect and go back the other direction, increases the amplitude of the wave next to the side of the head. Okay? That's called boundary gain. And boundary gain is frequency selective with the size of the object that's impeding the sound. So as soon as the sound gets to be about half a wavelength is the size of your head, you start getting some gain, and in the end you've got uh, some gain that stays about the same as the frequency goes up. So that's one effect. The second effect here is the torso and neck. So this is your body and your neck next to your head. Now, your body is bigger, and so you've got more gain over here, but there comes a frequency where You've got a body and a head, but you've got some space in between, and it acts as uh, like a filter. And, and so you actually have a, a point here where it goes negative in gain, and that's where sound is winding its way through between your neck and your head a little bit. And then up above a certain frequency, it, it starts not mattering anymore. So that's another curve that goes in there. <clears throat> so that's the head and the body and the neck. And now we've got these colored curves right here. Uh, three is the concha, and uh, we're going to have to flick back, oh no, I very conveniently uh, did this illustration. The uh, three is the concha, and that's this major bowl of your ear, that's this part right here. And five, this one, this big one, is your primary eardrum resonance that happens at about, I kept, I kept on saying 3.5, but the folks at the uh, at Edomotic, um, uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> Say, tell me it's 2.7, and I will absolutely go, okay, 2.7, you're the boss. Uh, and then uh, four, this is this little wobbly thing right here. This is the, 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 the flange on your pinna making some reflections. So anyway, you add all this stuff up together, and you get this response right here. You'll notice you're at 200 hertz down here. So it starts rising actually fairly low. Um, and I, frankly, don't entirely buy this curve. But, but there is a, a rise for a while till you get to 1 kilohertz, and then a, a much steeper rise up to 2.7, and then a, a curved shape falling off till 10K. And at 10K right here, you're about baseline. So at 10K, it comes down to about the baseline level. And if you guys look at, uh, well, let's see if it's the next thing or not. Okay, so now we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about a problem. Well, that, that right there was for 45 degrees. And as you change this angle, all those curves change. 
and they change all over the place. And, and as your ear changes, different people's ears, those curves are going to change. So, so, oh, we can draw a nice pretty curve, but, you know, does it really apply to everybody? And, you know, does a, you know, what is it, what happens if it's 30 degrees or all sorts of weird axes that it could be coming from? What do we, what do we pick? Well, in, in the world of audio engineering, there's been historically two adopted standards for transfer functions for audio, the free field and the diffuse field. Put simply, free field response is a sound coming directly from in front of you in an anechoic chamber. Okay? That's, so you have what's the response at the eardrum from the sound coming directly at you in an anechoic chamber. And the diffuse field response is sort of the complete opposite. It's what if sound was coming at you from all directions in a room that was made out of concrete and is just going like that. What's the, what's the response at the ear? All right, so this is what these responses look like. Now, they're upside down because they're corrections. So if, if you flip this over, you're going to have something like that curve that we showed you before. And the diffuse field curve, this one right here, is probably the closest to an averaged sort of response because it's kind of an averaging, okay? Um, but it's really not necessarily quite right. It wasn't designed for headphones. So, so the first most important question that we could ask is what makes sense for a headphone curve. What is the normal acoustic environment that we find ourselves listening to uh, when we're listening to music and speakers on speakers? Well, it's, it's speakers. Music is designed and engineered to be played back on speakers. And so I would contend and have for years that the target response curve that we should be looking for is what's at the ears when you play good speakers in a good room. That is what headphones are trying to simulate. Because they're completely artificial. They, they need to try to do something that's really real, and speakers in a room is really real. Uh, so now there's another thing about speakers that you do have to understand, and that is a good speaker measures flat in an anechoic chamber. But when you put it in a room, it's no longer flat, okay? Because of a couple things. One is the boundary gain of the room. There's gain in the room in the, in the low frequencies just because the room is, has a certain size. And then there's also that the power density in the room, high frequencies, as the frequency goes up on the speakers, the high frequencies tend to beam, okay? So the higher the frequency, the more it beams, and less of it is being sent out into the room. So the energy that's just being sent out into the room and not towards you, generally speaking, is low frequency heavy. Okay? So you take a good sounding speaker, a, a flat measuring in an anechoic chamber, and you put it in a room and it makes the speaker warmer. And we're used to that. And there's a whole lot of research done by Floyd Tool back in the day with uh, Sean Olive where they talked about this and they came to the conclusion that you don't want a speaker to be flat in the room. You want a, the speaker to be flat in an anechoic chamber and then take on the warmth of the room that you put it in. Because your ears, when you talk in that room and when you hear other people talk into that room, your ears figure that room out. And oh, this is the room and then this is the way this room sounds. Now when you play speakers in that room, you have to let those speakers make the room sound like it sounds or your brain's gonna go, this is not the way the room sounds. And so it's important to allow the speakers to, to energize the room and to understand that that's, your brain perceives that as normal. So Sean Olive, over the past little while, has been working on this curve. And uh, Sean Olive is at Harmon International. They're doing a bunch of research. I won't bore you with the details of this research, but they did a lot of research. Um, uh, I think there could be a lot more research that goes into this, but he's made this argument that uh, using subjective testing and all sorts of things, that this is the target response curve for a pair of headphones. And I would say that he's probably really close. 
So this curve right here is that kind of that curve you saw before. It goes, starts going up at about 200 hertz here, gradually gets to about 1K, goes up some. In this case, it's not 20 dB, but more like 15 dB, or maybe less actually, about 13 dB. And then it rolls off after, over the top, and at 10K, which is right here, you are about at baseline, okay? And that's what that sheet is on the front of the handout that you guys got. That is that sheet explained, okay, the, and, and putting some numbers on it. And at the moment, you're just gonna, if you wanna interpret a headphone measurement, you're just gonna have to memorize that curve. Someday, I'll be able to put that curve into the computer and, and get, cancel, you use it to correct the regular curve. Right now, I use a different correction curve, so the, the, frequency res the corrected frequency responses that I have tend to want to be a little bit warm tilted and then roll off uh, up above 4K or so like that to be, to be correct. Um, but I like actually using the raw measurements. Okay, so let's look at a headphone with a good frequency response. This is a uh, pair of uh, NAD Viso HP50s, and you'll see that it has this rising part. It doesn't start out at 200 hertz, though. It starts out a little higher in frequency. It has a rising part, and it goes up about 13 dB, which is about right, and it doesn't have, it goes up a little bit too steep here, and then this should be steeper, so this curve should go up like this, be underneath and, and curve up a little bit. And then it dips down too fast here, but it's about at baseline at 10K, so here's 10K, and it's about at baseline, and then it rolls off above. Now, that is about as close as you'll get to this curve with a pair of headphones. So that's, that's good right there. That's a pair of NAD Viso HP50s. Um, this is those curves right up against the, the regular curve. This is the NAD right here. Uh, and this is a Focal Spirit Professional. So it even has a bigger dip up above the 10K. There is some people who think that a dip between uh, 4K, uh, usually it's, it's like 5K to 8K. A dip in between 5 to 8K may be a good thing. The Philips X2 does it, and uh, um, they, may, they think that too much energy between 6 and 8K may be kind of annoying. So they, they're, they're, they talk about trying to stay away from it a little bit. All right, so there's that curve uh, that you guys have in front of you. I won't go into any more explaining of it, but it shows you exactly the kind of cross, the points at which you need to be aware. The green line is a speaker that measures flat in a room. And the way they got this curve was that they put two good speakers in a, in a really good room, took a dummy head, mannequin head, measurement head that looks like that. That's my measurement head that I use. And they put it in front of the speakers and they took measurements of it directly face on, a little left, little right, little up, little down, kind of averaged it out, and they come out with that, that curve that you saw before. Um, and of the green one, that's flat. That's a, a, a speaker that's caused to be absolutely flat in a room. And then they, then they did a lot of work to figure out what people wanted on headphones, and they figured that, found that people wanted more bass, and that bass would basically be there if these speakers were not EQ'd to be flat in a room. Okay. Uh, so when you put a regular speaker, it actually has that bass boost in it or something like that. And then they also found that people wanted, if you, there's too much treble, if, if a speaker is flat in a room, there's really too much treble. That there is some absorption, there is some additional weight in the low frequencies due to this, the, the boundary gains of the room. So a warm tilt, a little bit of a warm tilt occurs everywhere. In a, in a speaker response, and, and they found that people want a little bit of, they don't want all the high frequencies right there when it's right there next to your ear. Because in a room, you get a little distance on that, you get a little absorption and stuff, so it's a little gentler on the ears. 
Okay, so let's do a quick survey of some historically good sounding headphones. This is the H Sennheiser HD 580, famous, famous headphone. You can see it's got at the peak there. Um, it's at 3.5K, and, and that's why I always say 3.5K, because on most headphones it ends up at 3.5K, not 2.7. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> we're stuck with it, I think. But, uh, no bass boom here, no additional bass. So this is a, a, a result of a traditional open headphone that has a uh, uh, main diaphragm uh, resonance at about 100 hertz or so, and, and below resonance, the bass falls off. It's a natural result. You'll see, though, that uh, here's the, the bass line, and you go out to 10K, and the 10K notch is there. It's got a little bit of a notch before that, but that's OK. So th this, this artifact, this notch before 10K, a lot of times is just fine. There's no problem with it at all. Um, you'll also notice that there's a lot of gray lines, and there's only two up here. And that's because when I measure headphones, I measure them in five different positions. So I measure them a little bit forward, a little bit back, a little bit up, a little bit down, and centered. And then I average all those measurements. That's because there's a lot of resonances that go on in the ear. You'll see there's a lot of up and down here. You really don't know what's kind of going on, and if you average them all together, you'll have a better idea of what, how much energy is at those frequencies. It's called spatial averaging. Uh, AKG K701, kind of similar. Didn't have, didn't have that peak that the Sennheiser uh, 600 or 580 had. Comes up a little bit faster. Um, has maybe not quite as much bass. And if you look above this 3K point, it's staying rather flat. So this headphone is going to have a, a be brighter through that uh, middle treble region. And the K701 is a brighter headphone than a, than a 650 that we just saw a moment ago. It drops off nicely, crosses the line at 10K roughly. Otherwise, it's, and so it's other, otherwise pretty good, but it's going to be a little bit brighter than the 650 or the 580 that we just saw a moment ago. <clears throat> and then we have the Biodynamic DT880, uh, and it's got uh, more like the 650 up till the, this point, but it's not quite as high in that point. So this headphone might not have the presence that closest to the voice that makes you feel close to the voice, but it also, at 10K, is substantially above the baseline. So over here, it hasn't fallen off. So this headphone's going to have a lot of high treble energy, and which it does. So these, these, these three headphones, the 580, 7, 701, and 880, are famous for being this triplet of headphones where it's you know, warm, middle end, bright, kind of. But somewhere in there, they're near neutral. And, and that's been you know, for 10 years or whatever. Um, then we have the DT, uh, the Denon uh, D5000, which um, came along after the other three, the last three headphones, and people really liked. People thought, "Wow, this is something really special about this headphone." And I would contend, what it is, is a rising bass that people hadn't. If you look at this graph, this is a long, fairly straight, warm tilt. That's kind of what you're looking for in the compensated version of these graphs. Is this? long straight tilt. This is wrong, but this is something close to right, right here. So <clears throat> um, I think people like the D5000 because for the first time they were getting some solid oomph in the base of this headphone, along with pretty good response up on top. It's got a longer leading up to here. It's going to have some nice presence. Peak is in the right place at about the right time. This is a little problematic. This should go down to zero before 200 hertz. So you've got some bloat here in the lower mid-range. So this is going to be, it's going to make this headphone sound just a little thick um, through the lower mid-range. Uh, uh, and then, of course, now we get up to 10K and you're still 5 dB above the, the uh, line, which is going to give this headphone a little bit of a bright brightness to it. So all in all, this is a bit of a smiley face headphone, a little bit of bass accentuation, a little accentuation way up on top but otherwise pretty good in between. Sennheiser HD 800, uh, called by some, me the, included, the uh, world's best headphone. Um, doesn't have the roll off that the other traditional open dynamic headphones have, so it's got a little more oomph in the bass than the 650. Um, 
Nice flat response for sure, but it, it really should have started to rise somewhere out here to have the, the presence that we, we, we think should be there. And there's some, there's some concern about how much that really should be, but uh, it's got about the right rise up to the top, but again, it's staying up after 3K. So it's staying, staying, staying up till 6K before it starts to fall off. So this headphone has got a problem in that 6K region, 6, 7K region that I said that some people think it's okay to have a notch in, okay? Because it, it's not so aggressive and hard on your ears. And that's what makes this headphone problematic. It's a lot of, on a lot of front ends, that thing can drill holes in your ears if it's not just right getting fed by it and it's because of that. And we'll see a little bit later, there's some of the other things. And I think I have the 800 response on your sheet. Is the second page there probably? The third page? Okay, one of the things you may want to look at is the, the square wave response, the, uh, the lower square wave response on the right hand side where it has the little overshoot and the square wave. And that, my friends, is a very, very clean impulse response and square wave response. So the thing that the, you know, the 800 doesn't look all that great in terms of frequency response, but in the terms of its time response, it's phenomenal. So that's where it gets its power, not from this particular graph. Odyssey LCD3, first time I saw one of these, I went, wow, I've never seen a headphone that's flat like that all the way extended. Unbelievable. So this, when we first started hearing LCD3s in planar magnetic headphones, we were going, oh my gosh, headphones can have bass. They're amazing. And people were just floored by, wow, bass extension on a headphone, I can't believe it. Um, I would contend that we're going to find ourselves as time goes on here going, but it's not enough bass. We still actually need a little more than that. And I'm, I've gotten to the point where I think the Odysseys are bass light um, by a little bit. The bass quality is superb and the extension is superb, but it just want a little bit more. Of course, it's a matter of taste, so we don't know. Stacks, this is the uh, uh, SR007. Um, you can see that it's got a nice long sort of rise. It's a bit noisy and bumpy. It's a bit of a, a, a hassle to get there. It's a bit noisy and bumpy, but it goes up to the right place at the right time. And it also sort of comes down nicely until it gets to here where you've got something going on. There's all sorts of stuff going on. And at 10K, it's got a bit of a peak. Now, what you're looking for is the average around 10K at the baseline. But there's an eardrum, ear canal resonance at nine and a half K. Do you, do you know what the, the second resonance of the ear canal? I think it's, it's right around 10 K because it's 2.7 for the first one. So it's going to be like three times that. It's, it's somewhere in that area. It's, it's somewhere in that area. So there's another ear canal resonance that's going to happen there. And that's going to kind of change around depending on the stuff around it. So if there's a, a peak at 10K, that's it's kind of OK as long as the average around it is down on that baseline. Um, and what we see with this is that it, it, it probably isn't. There is a little bit too much energy at 10K. And of course, Stax electrostatic headphones are, tend to be just a, a little on the bright side, a little, on the, a little too airy side. This uh, down here, weird looking artifact, is due to pad bounce, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit more of that in a minute. That's the headphones bouncing against the side of your head with the, with the movement of the diaphragm. So there's a resonance of the pad itself. And we'll show you more pictures of that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, headphones near the target curve. We've talked about the NAD Viso HP50, very much like the target curve, uh, folk, uh, the Spirit Professional. Um, okay, so this is where I'm going to take some wild stabs at it. Here's some ear canal resonances. You'll see there's a peak there and a peak there and a peak there, and they're really, really clear. And my guess is that that headphone manages to excite the ear canal resonances really well for whatever reason, the way it focuses into the ear or whatever it is, but it does a good job of exciting the ear canal resonances. Similarly, the Sennheiser 580, you got a bump there and a bump there and a bump somewhere in there. Um, and what you'll see on these headphones is this little triple ringing thing on the front of the 
300 hertz square wave. And you see this surprisingly often. The, the uh, Skull Candy Aviators do it, and um, I, there's a, just a number of headphones that do it. And what I've found is that it tends not to be a problem. So when you see this, these three little rings that are going down like that, of about that period, and you see three peaks over here, it's ex probably exciting ear canal resonances, and your brain knows how to deal with that. So it, it tends, this tends not to be a problem, even though it looks like it might be a problem. Uh, this is, now we're, we're just going through some headphones that look close to the target curve. This is the Shure 1540, really one of their best headphones, I thought. You got a nice bass boost in here that kind of comes down to baseline. You don't have the long run up before, but you got the peak in the right place. And you got a nice falling response afterwards. I find this headphone to be a little bit bright in here and a little bit too bassy down here. Kind of a smiley face. It's a good headphone. When you see that a headphone that's got a little bit too much bass and a little bit too much treble, it's probably a good headphone to listen to at low levels because it's got a bit of a Fletcher Munson curve built right into it. Philips X2 uh, this one is a recently designed headphone, and, and it, uh, Rowan Williams, who designed this headphone, is well aware of all these things that we've been talking about. So he, we've got a, a bass boost in here of a, 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 a nice proportion, and it stops at 200 hertz. This roll-off, this is an open dynamic headphone. You can't get around it. Um, you have to be a sealed headphone to get around this this. Uh, uh, fall off below the primary driver resonance so they can be forgiven for having it. They're doing the best they can. Uh, got a nice little run up here. It doesn't have the rise, so it may not have quite that presence that, that uh, it should have. And here's that notch. These are, the, these are the headphones where they very, very specifically designed in this notch to get rid of any harshness. Uh, and then you see it comes back a little bit too hot and heavy, but if you look at the, kind of the average around this area, okay, it's low. Yeah, you got a little too much extra energy at 10K, but basically you've gotten yourself down to, to the baseline pretty much. Okay, uh, this headphone sounds a little bit grainy sounding. It sounds very nice tonally, but a little bit grainy, and I think that graininess you can see in all these little humps and wiggles. I think what they're done is they put this thing in a vise and they're just they're just squishing it into the shape that they want, doing all sorts of acoustic tricks, and it ends up making things a little uneven sounding. Uh, Vmoda XS is another really dandy little headphone. Uh, it's got a nice run up to here. Got too much bass, extends too far into the mid range though, unfortunately, so it's gonna sound somewhat thick. This peak is a little bit high, so you're gonna get a little extra brightness and it drops off a little too fast afterwards. You're down at 10K at the baseline, but there's not this arcing hump that's coming down. So this is a headphone that it has, it has a, a, a liveliness to it due to this peak, but it also has kind of a loss of snap and air and things like that. It kind of lacks a little definition uh, due to that kind of stuff. Uh, now that we're talking about in-ear response, this is one of the best in-ear response headphones I've seen. Um, We've got our, a little bit of a bass boost. It does bleed up a little bit high, unfortunately. But, you know, you don't want to try to overcorrect these things either. Uh, it's got the bump at uh, 3K. Now it's got a little extra bump up here. This is obviously um, very common for, to, when you see in-ear headphones to have these series of, of bumps and peaks. That's all the, the resonances of the tubing and all the various uh, bits and pieces in there. Um, you got to kind of just mentally average them out a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, a good shape for a headphone. And if you look at the compensated response, generally speaking, it's a, a nice flowing downward that gets steeper over time, which is what you're looking for on that one. Beats by Dre, Solo 2, Yes Sir Bob. Can't be bashing Beats too much anymore. Their Solo 2 is actually a pretty good headphone. We got too much bleed into the mid-range of the bass. So this headphone definitely th sounds thick in here. Um, but a good shape on this, and then a roll off back to baseline at 10K, but gone missing is the upper treble. So this headphone sounds a little thick and it lacks uh, articulation in the upper uh, treble. Uh, but otherwise, quite close to the target response curve. 
Uh, this is an AKG K267 on the uh, Tiesto on the club setting. This is a headphone that's got some club settings on it and a pretty good response. We got our notch there in, uh, in this region, which is probably okay. And we, they're, they're trying to keep the, the bass from going up too much over here, and, uh, but it's got some bass boost. There's other settings that have more bass in it, but uh, it's got a nice long run up, so it's a nice present sounding headphone. Uh, maybe, maybe a lack of high highs up here. Uh, Musical Fidelity MF10, this is a, this is a headphone when I, I listened to it and I didn't like it and then I measured it and I go, well, I should like this. This looks good. So you get your bass boost, right? It's a little excessive. Uh, comes down fairly quickly. You got a nice reasonably long run up to your peak here. The peak here is 15 dB above, which is a little too much. And then it stays high and you're getting some more of this energy in 5 and 6K and then you get over to 10K and well, actually, we're like still 8 dB high. And that's what killed this headphone. This headphone, when you listen to it, is way bright. It's just way bright. And you kind of almost don't see it until you look carefully. So it's really important to look carefully at these graphs. Uh, ATH M50X, a little bit uneven. It's a low cost, relatively low cost headphone. Certainly got a lot of pad bounce going on down there. That's what all that stuff is in here. That's just the pad bouncing around. Um, uh, but it's got this you know, weird notch at 6K, but that's probably okay. You know, we, we can live with this notch if it stays fairly good otherwise, which it does. It's got the nice long run up. This is a great sounding headphone for a low cost headphone. All right, now some problems. Okay, so here's, here's a, a, a couple of IEMs. Um, and I see this all too often, and it's just absolutely ridiculous, but you got a bass boost that goes all the way up to 800 hertz. I think the bass ends way lower than that. Um, and it's got uh, 5, 10, 15, almost 20 dB of bass boost. This is just ridiculous. It's a, it's a <laughs> horrible. Um, treble is probably OK, but boy, you're just going to get overwhelmed by the bass. Uh, Bowers and Wilkins C5, same, same. Just huge amounts of bass. I don't know why they're doing that. Uh, here's a monster turbine on the top and the Turbine Pro. Uh, theoretically, the Turbine Pro is a better headphone. And uh, what do they do between the two of them? Well, they gave it less bass boost and less boost around there and actually made it look more like the target curve and people liked it more. And okay, fellas, follow that trail, get it down. Uh, and then here's the Edemotic ER4PT. This is where we'd get some uh, arguments with Mead Killian. Uh, he doesn't think that the, the bass needs to be bumped up. Um, but if you look, we've got a real nice, this, it is gradually starting a little bit uh, in here. It maybe could start a little bit earlier. It goes up nicely to uh, uh, 13 dB up uh, right in this area. And then falls down, got a notch here, which is probably okay. And uh, you're right at around the baseline at 10K. And then you've got uh, energy still existing up here. So it's going to enunciate well. I would say that the Edemotic uh, ER4P and uh, the, the ones that are close to that, there's a couple of models that, or is there any more? It's just the PT now? The S is still. Um, that this, it may be the most accurate, uh, in-ear headphone in terms of treble resolution. Um, and that's been a, 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 a thought in the headphone world for a long, long time. And, and I, can, I can assure you that Mead is, uh, at Edemotic is very, very interested in resolution up above 10K and how, that, how those high frequencies work. Um, this is actually a very, very good sounding headphone, although I'd still like a little bit more bass than, than what they got there. So here's pad bounce. Um, this is uh, the frequency response curves. And you can see in these curves this little artifact over here. And uh, this is with the Biodynamic DT48 that's got uh, air-filled cushions that are you know, pneumatic. And they really bounce a lot. So that's bouncing a lot. And um, I wasn't exactly sure. I mean, a lot of what I've learned about this, I've just learned by guessing, you know, and seeing it come out and talking to engineers and, and them telling me. Um, uh, but I, 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 
I said, you know, is that, is that the pad bouncing? And they go, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Well, <clears throat> I also noticed on my isolation plots, so this is, this is how well the headphone isolates. And I, I didn't understand this for quite a while, but you can see that this is zero dB isolation. So I'm getting no isolation up to 100 hertz. And then I'm actually getting louder here at 200 hertz. So the headphone is worse, is not, is, is not only are they not isolating, they're actually amplifying the sound at that frequency. And I go, what the heck is this on my isolation plots, this thing? And then I realized that it happens at the same place. And this is the pad bouncing against the side of your head, amplifying the outside signal, the outside sound as it comes in. So the outside sound is, is, ener is energizing the resonance, not just the driver. Here it's the, the driver energizing the resonance, and here it's the outside air, outside noise energizing the resonance. But sure enough, those, those artifacts are at the same exact frequency in all places, and that, that's what that comes from, the pads bouncing on the side of your head. So I told you I also uh, measure headphones in a number of different positions. And some headphones are more picky than others about getting a seal. And this is a good example of a headphone that um, has a problem with the seal. And you look, the, the, the frequency response is changing over the entire range here as I move these headphones around. And this is really common in headphones that are very, very tightly sealed. So this is a headphone that has a very, very tight seal on the side of your head. And what happens is it either seals or doesn't seal. And we'll show you another picture of that in a minute. And what I will do is a lot of times when I'm measuring a headphone like this, I've got some um, felt that I can stick in between the headphone and the, and the, and the uh, head so that I can make it like there's a controlled leak like your hair. And a lot of times it'll make this measuring a headphone like this less touchy. But the other thing is, is if I, if I have a really a hard time getting a headphone to measure properly, I will allow one of these. I could, I could have not had this artifact in here because I can, I can see that it's not sealed right when I'm, when I'm adjusting the headphones. But if I've gone through three different positions and it's been a pain in the ass every time, and I set it down and it's not sealed right, I'm gonna go, fine, I'm letting this one go through because this headphone is hard to seal. So I will let, there is an art to, do, to making these measurements. There is a degree of control that I have over what these measurements look like and I try to be as honest as I can in that it, to what the headphone sounds like. A lot of times I will stop a measurement, take the headphone off and listen more carefully. How much is the bass? How is it changing when I seal? So I can get the feel for what the headphone is like. So when I put it back on, I'm measuring it so that it looks like what I heard. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of a fine art to this thing. Um, this is an on-ear headphone and this is a situation where it just seals differently no matter where I put it. So it's just, it's just all over the place. And I just do the best I can for most of the measurements and then in the end see what comes out, you know? And um, that's what you get. But if you see something like that, it's because this headphone just doesn't like to seal on the ear very well. Uh, and then um, this is the one. This is the one where it clicks. It does one or the other. There's this. It either does this or it does that, but it doesn't do anything in between. And um, I'll try to get it to do this all the time, but a lot of times headphones like this, it just won't cooperate. So I have to let it do what it does. But it does that on the head, on your head as well. So it's legitimate to to allow these artifacts to show up in the measurement. Now. Um, I'm gonna uh, go to a comb filter. I, 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 anybody know what a comb filter is? A couple of people, okay. So a comb filter is if you take an audio signal and then you take the same signal and delay it just a little bit, okay, and put it back onto itself, you get times when uh, these uh, frequencies, this, at, at, start again. Take an audio signal and you go through a delay of X amount of time. And then you change the frequency as you run up and you get to places where there's nulls where the half wavelength is exactly the length of that delay. And, and then it cancels out exactly. And so at 
500 hertz and 1500 hertz and 2500 hertz and blah da da da, you're going to get cancellations. Now that can happen in a headphone if there's sound that comes from the back of the driver around to the front of the driver and enters the area in your ear. And uh, Ultrasone is famous for this. The, one of the ways that they try to synthesize um, the, their S logic, they call it, it's some of the sound from behind the driver comes back around in front and goes into the acoustic chamber. And what I've found, whenever I see artifacts that look like this, is that the headphones are horrible. So you can see up here, you've got this bump. And then there's another one right there that you can see. You can see it mostly this and then one more. So this is biodynamic T1. But if you look at the uh, square wave response in time, you see these really sharp, nasty looking edges. And these, if you remember that other set of nice rings, are markedly different looking. These are jagged looking. And the other rings were nice sine waves just collapsing down. So these have a broader frequency component because they're not sinusoidal. Uh, here's another one. You can see these very distinct bumps. This is the AKG K812. And you can see how jagged the response is here. Similarly, the ultrasone, this is the ultrasone I was mentioning. Again, very, very much having these effects and having really uh, disturbing uh, uh, transient responses there. So that's one to keep out your eye out for. If you see these humpty bumpty things up here and you see this stuff, it, you're going to have a headphone that's tizzy and uh, not very good resolving. OK, earbuds suck. As a class, there are no earbuds that sound any good whatsoever. These are the kinds that rest in the concha of your ear. They don't have any seal. They can't get bass into your ear, basically, because they're just too small. They can't move enough air, and they're not sealed. And so you end up with uh, no bass on the bottom end. And this, this is pretty good. This actually looks pretty good right here. And this is a pretty good ear, earbud. But you know the kids, they want bass. So they're going to turn this stuff up. They're going to try to get something out of this. And they're going to end up with all this stuff really, really loud in their ears. And that's not good for the health of your ears to be listening to that. Earbuds are just downright dangerous. Well, Apple knew that. And I'll tell you something, for starters, the regular old Apple earbud, by the time their last one came around, was actually pretty darn good. You might have noticed that this has better, flatter extension than that Sennheiser we just saw. Uh, um, and it's got a decent up here, but you still got no bass. Well, they came out with the ear pods that focused more of the sound into your ear. And they actually managed to get from the, the roll-off starting at 200 hertz to the roll-off starting at 100 hertz, well, that's a whole octave. Okay, That's pretty good, really. Um, so the new Apple EarPods are, really probably are the best earbud that I've ever heard or measured. Uh, one of the best. This is the best, the UNPK1. It's kind of inefficient, but all right, so here's some really bad ones just to uh, laugh at them. Uh, the Howard Light Sync. This is, a, this is a, actually an industrial headphone that um, is made for um, isolating you. So it's for work environments, but it's got uh, headphones in it so you can listen to music while you're doing it. Just miserable. Just incredibly screechy bright up here. Just, oh, they were just horrible. Um, this is the current COS Pro 4AA. You'd think that was an earbud, but it's a full-size sealed headphone. Just miserable. This is the uh, Flare Audio R1. This is an interesting headphone. It was designed by one of Metallica's or some death metal band's uh, recording engineer who had an idea that this uh, pattern of diffusers behind the cup would, would work really well. well any pattern means that it's probably going to have some resonant frequencies. And boy, has it got a resonant frequency right there in the middle. These were just bleh, horrible sounding. All right, so I got 10 more minutes in like 50 more slides. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about square waves. A lot of people normally they talk about square waves as the sum of a bunch of odd harmonics. 
And that's true. You get all the odd harmonics, you put them in the proper phase alignment, you add this row of sine waves together, and you get that. And then if you add like, you know, 11 or 12 harmonics or whatever this, you get something that looks even more square. You change the phase so that the high frequencies are more advanced, and you can get a little lip on the front end like that. You uh, change the ratio, so if you have more high frequency energy and not enough low frequency energy, you get sine waves that look like that, or square waves that look like that. And, and if you put too much low frequency and not enough high frequency, you get rounded off square waves that look like that. So the point about square waves is that as frequency response changes, the shape of the square wave changes. But it gets real confusing thinking about square waves as all the odd harmonics and, oh, does that mean that you can only measure the frequencies at the odd harmonics of the thing? Well, there's another way to think about square waves entirely, and that is like it's a switch. I'm going to turn it on, I'm going to turn it off, and then I'm going to turn it on, and then I'm going to turn it off. Okay? It's not made of odd harmonics, really. You could analyze it like that, but it's not made that way. It's made by turning something on and off. And what happens is the leading edge how fast it goes up, this is slew rate limited. And that slew rate is going to be proportional to the, the band pass, the high frequency response of you know, how flat, how high something is. So how quickly it can get up on the leading edge is going to be totally indicative of the high frequency response. And then its ability to keep that energy up there for a long period of time is proportional over time to lower and lower frequencies. So when you look at a square wave, you're actually looking at the frequency response in another way. The thing is, is that you add in some phase stuff. So you can have some changes in, the, in this due to the phase shift um, that, where, that don't show up on the frequency response. Uh, all of this stuff that you're seeing today is on, on the Interfidelity site um, in the well, I don't know if I can actually show it to you on here, but um, uh, on the top bar, on the nav bar, there's a thing called resources, and then it goes interpreting measurements and stuff like that, and then there's some links to articles that have most of the stuff in here. This is a chart that talks about the shape of the square waves and, and uh, what it means. Um, I'll draw your attention to this one. Just because it goes below the zero line like that, and this one, does not necessarily mean it doesn't have low frequencies. In fact, if it goes below the line like that, it means the low frequencies are there, they're just out of phase. So what this means is this may have plenty of bass, it's just going to be loose sounding bass. Uh, Sennheiser HD 800, here again we're looking at the square waves. We, we have a lack of bass on the Sennheiser 800, which is indicated by this line falling here. And, but we have incredible resolution. You remember seeing those jaggedy square waves on the T1, the Bayer T1? Look how absolutely pure and clean this transient edge is. That transient edge is key for you to be able to tell where a sound is coming from because your ears cue on time, time arrival signals. And your ears want to hear that edge very, very clearly in order to be able to localize where the sound is coming from. Well, that's imaging. So if you have really fine leading edge response like that, you're going to get good imaging. If you have three leading edges on this squirrely thing, wh what are your ears trying to cue on? What's, where's the time? It, they won't, it'll confuse them, and it'll collapse the image. So uh, the, uh, the uh, AKG K701 series headphones has a square wave that looks a lot like that, and they image very well as well. Here's the Odyssey LCD2. It has something, uh, well, first of all, wow, talk about bass response. So that's a lot of bass response right there. And then it had this, uh, and this is pre-phaser, that has these like double front end things. And this is one of those ones where it probably doesn't do too much bad to the sound, but it, it does do some stuff in terms of pinpoint precision imaging. Same is true with the, uh, the uh, Sennheiser HD 580 that has that triple front end the triple leading edge. It doesn't, it doesn't harm it tonally and it doesn't hurt to listen to, it's not aggressive, but you lose some definition and the image isn't, it doesn't image quite as big. Great OPS 1000. It's painful to look at, I'm sorry. 
Uh, Sony MDRV 600. This is an old school headphone. Got bass going out of phase there, and uh, doesn't have a lot of high frequency response. Um, and then I'd start in THD plus noise, but I'm going to let you guys just ask some questions because I've got like five minutes left, and and yeah, I got like five minutes left. So why don't you guys just go ahead and ask some questions? Yeah. Pardon me. Bose, well, Bose, uh, I don't have any pictures of it uh, right here. I mean, I have, I have some um, I could get out, but the, the Bose products, the, uh, their noise-canceling headphones are very, 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 very good. Um, they, they don't measure particularly well, but most noise-canceling headphones are just pretty horrible in terms of the way they measure. They do all sorts of weird things to the sound. And... Um, Let's. Because uh, it's worth looking at a noise canceling headphone because they're so weird. This is the my all graphs PDF. Uh, well, there are currently 736 measurements in the database here, so it gives you an idea of how many have been measured. How long does it take to measure one tip one tip or how? It's typically about 45 minutes if I do it straight. Um, so this is a audio noise canceling headphone. This is measured passively, which is actually pretty good. And then the noise canceling active. And this is one of the better ones, but you can look at the square wave and you get some pretty weird stuff in the, the high frequency response of the square wave. Um, there's some, definitely some pretty weird ones. Audio Technica, look at the shape of the square waves. The treble is completely out of phase here. So it starts going down and then goes up. So it's, it, the, treble is, the high treble is completely out of phase on that due to the noise canceling circuit. Um, Audio Technica noise canceling, you see it's really ragged looking. Also, look at the distortion figures right here. This, you want all this to be below this middle line, below the 1% 1, 1 line, and, and a lot of these headphones are going over um, that. Uh, this is the Bose Quiet Comfort 25. So this is a Bose noise canceling headphone. And what you'll see is that it's got good shape on the, on the frequency response. It's got, um, boy, that's just terrible, isn't it? Um, just, it, but this is not bad shape. This is pretty good shape of these square waves, um, all things considered. So Bose is pretty good for noise cancelers, for sure. There are, other, there are other passive headphones, not so much. Yeah. Uh, there, it's kind of subtle differences. Um, the, I use what's called the independent of direction. It's not an industry standard compensation curve. It's one that comes with that head that I thought was the best to use. I've come to believe that it would probably have been better to use the, the uh, diffuse field response um, because it has more of that presence region rise in it. Um, I, I will eventually, one of the things that I'm working on this year is trying to get people to sponsor, like people like Sennheiser and Philips and uh, 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 big headphone companies to sponsor the, uh, uh, the development of an online tool like Headroom has where you can just say, I want to see this headphone, this headphone, and this headphone and compare them all together and it'll throw the graphs up there together. And then you can clip and copy that and put it in a post. Um, and I, I very much want to do that. That's one of my most important goals in life is to get this, but it's tricky because I, I don't have the budget for it. So I got to convince some advertisers to cough up $30,000. And if any of you know any software companies that are particularly good at doing graphs and stuff like Wall Street graphs, 
please let me know about it because I'm going to have to find some people and get a quote on this. All right, my time is up, but. I was going to say you might want to look at Tableau. Tableau? Okay. Yeah. How is headphone amplifier output impedance had an effect on your measure? Ah, that one's too long to answer in the, okay. the no time. Uh, the impedance do you use for your measurements? Mostly? Oh, the, the, these are all measured at like less than an ohm. So it, it, it's very little effect. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody.